Hello everyone and again welcome in lecture 4 of AMC MCQ free booster course with SOMA I am Dr. Omar Shakori. I will be your tutor for this lecture you can find our Facebook group and you can join us I will put the link for our Facebook group in the description also you are welcome to join our Academy for study on teachable also I will put the link below you are welcome to join our next full cover course for AMC and secure preparation the duration for this course is 100 days and we will discuss online in online live sessions all the materials of medicine surgery obstetric gynecology pediatric psychiatric and public health also we will do all the recalls of 2018 and 2019 I will put the link for the details of our full cover course preparation let's go to our lecture 4 Question number uh, 46. An alcoholic man presented with severe epigastric pain after bouts of projectile vomiting. What's the next line of management? Very important scenario, very repetitive, commonly seen in many examinations, and you will see it repetitive rates is uh, very high for this question. Alcoholic man, severe vomiting, projectile vomiting and now presented with severe epigastric pain screen okay I'll share it again and you will see it again now you can see it okay <coughs> okay I will repeat it again. This is very, very important scenario. Alcoholic man, after he got a boot of projectile vomiting, he presented to you with severe epigastric pain. What is the next line of the management? What's the next line of the management? And why? If you see, if you said it's C or B or A, just mention why. What do you think it's happened for this man? Gastric perforation, pancreatitis. Mm. Perforation. Perforation of what? Gastric perforation? Yes, Borheev. Yes, it's Borheev. You have to know. You have to know, whenever there is a scenario of severe vomiting, an alcoholic man presented with chest pain or epigastric pain, the examiner is now speaking about Borheev. Or Borheev, if you don't know what's Borheev, Borheev is the esophageal rupture, ruptured esophagus. Ruptured esophagus is caused by severe vomiting. Severe vomiting. An alcoholic man will equal ruptured esophagus. And this can be diagnosed by asking the patient to uh, drink 
gastrographin. Gastrographin. In other uh, MCQ question, they will put gastrographin, and the, in another choice, they will put barium uh, meal and OGD and etc. Et Gastrographin should be used, not the enema, uh, sorry, not the barium uh, material, not the barium meal. We have, sorry, we have to uh, use gastrographin, not the barium meal. Guess why we, we are using gastrographin? I want you, I want to repeat it again for you, please. Esophageal rupture equal or caused by severe vomiting in alcoholic person. This esophageal rupture, we can diagnose it by uh, a swelling of, uh, uh, swallowing of gastrographin, not the barium. If we use the uh, barium, the barium will cause mediastinitis. The, the, the barium, after leakage from the esophagus to the mediastinum, it causes mediastinitis. Gastrographin will not cause mediastinitis. That's why they are insisting on this question. It's very important. You have to know whenever you are thinking about rupture esophagus, directly your mind should go to the gastrographin. Yes, the, the definitive is also the gastrographin. You will see the leakage of the material of the gastrographin by the x ray, the leakage outside the esophagus. So just I want it, I want you to know it, to know how to uh, get the scenario of the uh, rupture esophagus and to know what's the next in rupture esophagus. The next is to, uh, to let the patient drink a gastrographin. So you can see it in, in your x-ray, an x-ray of the patient, I mean. Okay. Dr. Pin, you have a good question. I uh, I want to write down this for you, how to differentiate between Hirschsprung and uh, pyloric stenosis in the Facebook. Just put the question there and I will explain to you how to differentiate between them as simply. You are welcome. Okay. Several people, uh, several people in a city has abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. There is a recent work and open call seam. What to do next? Many people got the same uh, features, the same symptoms. Uh, there is a recent work in the city. So you are, you are a doctor responsible in that area and what you will do next for this city, for the people in this city? Is it to inform the health authority? Is it to uh, inform environmental protection authority? Is it to check CBC blood investigation? What do you think? Okay, everyone got a, a question, um, an answer. Okay, let me answer you. 
according to the Australian protocol, all of us when seeing a public problem, public medical problem, we have to inform the health authority. Absolutely, this will happen. But before informing the health authority, we have to check our patient. We have to do the minimum investigation like CBC blood chemistry. So here, the question is about what to do next. To do next is to check. After checking, I will go for informing the health authority. So the answer here is C, is to check the CBC and the blood biochemistry for those people. Okay? They want you to think that you are not just a communicator between the health authority and the city. Oh, uh, I have patients. Okay, I will investigate them. I will check them. And after that, I will inform the health authority. But I will not just making a call. Hello, info, hello, health authority. I have patients. They will say, you check them? Huh? Oh my God, I didn't check them. Think like that. So we have to check them and then to inform. Yes, also. Yes, 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 Dr. Mohammed. Okay. Now, child scenario of meningitis with fever, nausea, vomiting, head tail to the right. What investigation should be done? What do you think? <coughs> Really, this is incomplete scenario. If the question, what is the next or what is the best, the best investigation to be done in case of meningitis, the best investigation to be done in the case of meningitis is lumbar puncture. So if the question is, what's the best investigation to diagnose meningitis, it's lumbar puncture. But what's the next in cases of uh, meningitis, the next is to send for a blood culture and to give antibiotic, empirical antibiotic. So it is incomplete scenario. But I want, I put it uh, so you can uh, think with me about the possible uh, appropriate answers for it. Meningitis, best investigation is lumbar puncture but the next investigation will be blood culture and the next step after blood culture we're taking the blood is to give is to admit the patient to the hospital and give empirical treatment okay i will answer you uh, i will ask you a question what is the most important step to do before doing lumbar puncture? What do you think? Before you are going for doing lumbar puncture, what's, what's, what you have to do? Yes, you have to do CT. Why you have to do CT? CT or MRI, anyone? Why it's to do CT? Check up for increased, yes, yes, to exclude brain edema, yes, or increased ICP. How we can how we can diagnose increased ICP, or how we can uh, see brain edema? No, in the CT. What's the feature of that? Dilated ventricles. Okay, it's just for going outside the AMC, just for thinking more. The AMC about the meningitis scenario, if you got meningitis scenario, if asking what's the best investigation will be lumbar puncture, before lumbar puncture, 
uh, sometimes they are asking before lumbar puncture, what you have to do? You have to check the patient by CT. And if uh, the question is about what's the next investigation, the next investigation is to do, is to do uh, a blood culture. If mentioned in the scenario, you taking a blood for a blood culture, what's the next step after taking a blood culture is to admit the patient to the hospital and to start the IV empirical antibiotic. Okay. Old women diagnosed with the as schizo, taking uh, venalefixine. Now she became confused. She become confused. Daytime sleeping and reduced concentration. What test you will do? I want everyone now to give me the the correct answer. I want you to give me the correct answer. This question is related to question before we are speaking about patient become confused, become confused, please. She's schizophrenia on treatment. She is well controlled. She is an old female. She is an old, get acute confusion. Confusion, we are speaking about acute confusional disorder, happened in psychiatry. I mentioned before, yes, it's urine, yes, it's urine, yes, it's delirium. Now the patient got delirium, daytime sleeping and awake in the night and became change, change in, his, in the personality in the night reduce concentration, become confused. This is what we can take from this uh, scenario. We can know this is about, it's speaking about delirium and uh, what's what the test there, I, as I said, the most common cause in old age people of delirium is the general, uh, is the UTI and the next test will be the urine culture and sensitivity, urine general examination, urine analysis. I don't care, it's related to the urine. So I have to investigate the urine. Okay, you get it? I want you to think like this. Delirium, as simple as that, Dr. Maria. Delirium, as simple as that, is equal to acute confusional state that happened in the night. Acute confusional state with uh, sundowning feature. Sundowning features mean the patient become aggressive, change, changes in the personality in the night, uh, and uh, uh, become confused. In the daytime, he, the patient is well and obey your command. And the most common cause in old patients, in old people, the most common cause of delirium is the UTI. And what is to do on those people examination or investigation is to examine their urine either by urine analysis or the urine culture and sensitivity whatever available in your choices just go for it related the uh, relationship between the UTI the relation between the UTI and the delirium it's just mentioned by uh, uh, by a study papers. Uh, I I don't remember uh, in any site I found it, but this is uh, recorded in Australia that there is associates association between delirium and the 
UTI, so everyone there know whenever they uh, suspect delirium, they have to uh, examine for UTI and they have to treat the UTI if the patient got it because it's the most common cause of delirium in old patients. I want. <laughs> I I don't want you to waste your time on finding on or looking. Just keep this information in your mind. Believe me, I will give you you a lot a lot of information. Just put it in your mind. Okay. Child with signs and symptoms of meningitis. Still, we are speaking about meningitis. Uh, develop seizure. Generalized, lasting for five minutes. His labs value are normal except for sodium. Sodium also was low. 120. What to do next? Is it to give IV manitol? Is it to give normal saline? Is it to give hypertonic saline, fluid reconstriction, diuretics? Also, this is a repetitive scenario. I think you have an idea about it. We, are, we have hyponatremia, and the hyponatremia is associated with neuro, neuro feature, neuro symptoms, neurological symptoms. So absolutely, we have to treat with not uh, normal saline, not fluid restriction. We have to treat with 3% hypertonic saline. That's good. I want you to think like that because whenever the AMC will change uh, in the scenario, but they are still fixed and sticky to the same topics. I want you to know how to deal with these topics, not only the, the MCQ. That's good. Can we take uh, 10 minutes just to take coffee or something? A rest for 10 minutes. Okay. 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 Take it. Okay. Okay. Let's take it. Okay. 10 minutes from now. Okay. Bye. See you. Then I will uh, provide it to you uh, after the meeting today. And this file will be updating by, uh, lecture by lecture. Okay. Question number uh, 51. A child with nephrotic syndrome treated with a steroid developed hypertension diffuse abdominal pain and vomiting for one week, a febrile. What's the most common cause for this feature? What do you think is the most common for this feature? Patient child known with the nephrotic syndrome on treatment, he got hypertension, diffuse abdominal pain and vomiting. Is it acute pancreatitis? Is it acute pyelonephritis, renal artery, stenosis, and renal vein thrombosis? This is renal vein. It's renal vein thrombosis. So I want you to know the important things about nephrotic syndrome complication. In your exam, 
I want you just to save two complications, the most common complication for uh, the nephrotic syndrome, which is infection. Okay, complications of nephrotic syndrome, we have two complications. Number one is infection, number two is the thrombophilia. Thrombophilia, for example, the renal vein thrombosis. Infection is caused the most common, the most common cause of infection as a complication for nephrotic syndrome is streptococcus pneumonia. Streptococcus pneumonia. The most common organism that causes infection in cases of nephrotic syndrome. I will repeat it again. Nephrotic syndrome, we have two complications, either infection or thrombophilia. Thrombophilia, renal vein thrombosis. Here the, the patient is present with renal vein thrombosis, one of the, this complication. It's renal vein thrombosis because the patient got abdominal pain and vomiting. So this is caused by thrombophilia, renal vein thrombosis. It's very, very common scenario. The other uh, also common question in nephrotic syndrome regarding the complication is that of infection. What's the most common organism caused infection in cases of nephrotic syndrome? It is streptococcus pneumoniae. Okay? Okay. Now a boy, uh, a boy came with high fever and a swollen knee, pain in the middle tubercle, medial tubercle of the knee. What's the treatment you will give? High fever and single swelling joint, or in here it's a swelling knee. High fever. This means infection. Single joint, this means arthritis. So the, the scenario is about septic arthritis. Yes. So what's your next step or what's the treatment you will give? Absolutely, nowadays we are giving the fluxacillin as the main drug for, treating, for treatment of septic arthritis. Okay. Really, uh, I don't, Dr. Lara, I don't uh, remember what's the most common cause for uh, causing sept septic arthritis. I don't remember it, but uh, just the question is about the fluxacillin because this is uh, the new protocol for septic arthritis. Before, we, we were uh, used to give the a broad spectrum antibiotic, for example, we, we were used the clafuran, cefetriaxone, and nowadays it's fluxacillin. So they are insisting on this question because they know the overseas uh, doctors doesn't know the updates of Australian protocols. So nowadays they are asking about the fluxacillin for septic arthritis. Man has soiled lacerated wound. Man has soiled lacerated wound. He had simple uh, scratch wound five days ago. For that, he received diphtheria, tetanus toxoid, and no history of vaccination, asking most appropriate step after deployment. Very important question. Uh, in many typical, many, many other scenarios, the uh, lacerated wound and the ATS, how to deal with it, and the deployment. If you get, please, concentrate about that. Focus on what I will say. 
if you get a wound, whatever was the wound, lacerated wound, and asking about what's the next step, the next step will be wound depridement. Okay? After the wound depridement, we will check the vaccination of this patient. Vaccination regarding uh, tetanus vaccine. In this scenario, we have no history of vaccination unknown history of vaccination. The patient is not vaccinated. So what we will give, and we have lacerated wound, soil, this means a dirty wound. So we have to give both the tetanus toxoid and the tetanus immunoglobulin. But, but, but in this scenario, your patient five days ago received the tetanus toxoid because of another scratch. So the only one now to be giving is the tetanus immunoglobulin. Tetanus, this is, uh, this is C, tetanus immunoglobulin. He received the tetanus toxoid five days ago. Now he can took the tetanus immunoglobulin. But if the same scenario, if the same scenario, and it comes before, and tell you that your patient not five days ago he received tetanus toxoid, five weeks ago the patient received tetanus toxoid. Five weeks or six weeks ago, and he received tetanus toxoid, and now he came with a new presentation, soiled lacerated wound, infected wound, so need both tetanus toxoid and tetanus immunoglobulin. In your uh, choices, they put tetanus, both tetanus toxoid and immunoglobulin or to give just immunoglobulin because he received tetanus toxoid previously. In this scenario, also you will choose both tetanus toxoid and tetanus immunoglobulin. If the period is, is um, let's say, below four weeks of giving tetanus toxoid, there is no need to repeat it. But after the fourth week and the patient got another injury, another wound, we have to repeat the tetanus toxoid. This is according to Australian protocol. Most, most of the studies show it is uh, four weeks and there is a paper of six weeks. In your exam, keep it in mind as a four weeks and go for uh, resolving your MCQs. Okay, <coughs> sorry. Okay, you, okay, I will repeat it. Okay. Regarding the ATS, regarding the uses of uh, anti-tetanus, we have to know if the patient got uh, infected wound or not, and we have to know the history of vaccination. In this scenario, Whenever, whenever uh, I will, uh, I want you, uh, I want you to put this uh, question in uh, Facebook group. Okay, I want to give you the exact, uh, uh, let's say, the exact keys how to reach your diagnosis. Okay, just remind me, and one of you uh, to put. Uh, a post about uh, speaking about infected wound and uh, depridement and five days, the same scenario after I will give it to you, just to put it. Okay. Okay. But simply, 
I don't uh, know why it's uh, the voice. The voice is clear for you. Just tell me. The voice is clear for you. What about the others? Is it poor? Okay, okay, okay. I will move on. Uh, this equation, put it in the group and I will discuss it with you again. So, no, here is the answer is to give tetanus immunoglobulin because the patient received tetanus toxoid in a period of five days, which is below four weeks. So we will give only tetanus immunoglobulin. If the patient, if the wound was not infected, I mean not soiled, we will go for choose do no more treatment. Because immunoglobulin will be given for infected wound. Just remind me, I want to make a, uh, a good explanation for that by, uh, by photos. Okay. Now patient put a Facebook status for you that you didn't treat him well and no one should get the treatment from you. What you will do, this is also, as I told you, this is a situation question. They want to know what's your uh, ability to, to deal with this situation. Patient said that Dr. Omar is a very bad doctor and we cannot depend on him. And uh, no one should, should be treated by this doctor. Etc. of saying another word, of course. So we, we have to ignore them. We have to ask patient to come uh, and to discuss with you. We have to inform the defense manager or to write, write uh, a response on the post on the Facebook. What's the most appropriate one? No, you, uh, you have, no, 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 no. We have not, uh, let's say, we, we must not ignore them. They are our patients and saying a negative feedback about us. We have not to ignore them. Also, we have not to write them in public like they, they, they are doing. We have to ask this patient to come to us and to discuss what's happened and what make him or her writing this feedback. So we have to discuss with them. Discuss is the main uh, key for any question of situation. Whenever you have seen a question of situation and there is an answer, discuss with the patient, discuss with the manager, discuss with your colleague about his uh, job, this will be the most appropriate answer for the question. So if you don't have any idea about it and you see a, a word of discuss with the patient, discuss with the colleague, discuss with the manager, discuss with the wife, discuss with the caregiver, caregiver, discuss with the parents, go directly to this option. Okay. Okay. A four-year-old uh, male child is brought to the emergency department after ingestion of uh, grant of his grandfather pills 15, 15 minutes ago. 
which one of the following is present is not a contraindication for gastric lavage. Coma, presence of gag reflex, ingestion alkali, acids, and uh, petrochemicals. What do you think? We are speaking about contraindications for gastric lavage. All are true except, yes, it's a simple question. The coma is contraindication to do gastric lavage, ingestion of alkali or acid or petrochemicals are contraindication for gastric lavage. Presence of gag reflex is not contraindication for gastric lavage. Okay. Patient was brought to the emergency room after a uh, fight causing by stab or it's also a scenario of stab knife in the chest. Patient uh, blood pressure was normal, repeated uh, his mildly decrease. It's the same scenario, absolutely. Trachea deviated uh, to the site of the injury, so he's the scenario is about massive hemothorax. What's the next? The next is to give, is to put just a tube. Okay. You are a doctor in a rural hospital in North Australia, and the patient come after 13 minutes, was biting by a brown snake, snake bite in his left ankle. The patient has no symptoms. Okay, the patient snake and the patient has no symptoms after 30 minutes. Uh, and there were simple scratch over the skin, over the ankle with no marks of snake teeth. The tertiary hospital is 150 kilometers from away. What is the urgent next step? What is the next step? So asking about the next step to be do. Is it to call for helicopter ambulance to, to tertiary hospital? Is it to give, uh, is, uh, is it to give antivenom ampoule and another ampoule after symptoms appear? Is it to tell the patient to go home? Is it to urgent apply uh, for tourniquet in the upper uh, part of the thigh, no option mentioned to manage the scratch locally or bandage. Okay. The best, the best answer, if available, will be bandaging. Just bandaging uh, the leg or the hand of the patient. But here is there is no this option. So what's the what you will do? Is it to bring helicopter? Of course you will not. Is it to apply tourniquet? Of course, this is out of medicine, it's not used. Is it to tell a patient? Is it to tell a patient to go home? No, still it's a snake bite and need observation. So the only acceptable uh, answer for that is to give antivenom ampoule and another ampoule just after symptoms appear. That's mean we will keep the patient under observation. Not to send it home, not to send it uh, by helicopter, and not to put tourniquet for him. Okay. I want you to know about the snake bite. I want, yes, I'm, I'm putting it. I want you to know about the snake bite. What's the most important uh, next step in the management? The next step will be bandage the leg or bandage of the hand, according to the site of the uh, snake bite. So the first step in the snake bite and the next step in the snake bite is bandage, applying bandage locally. After that, after the applying bandage, if the patient reached the hospital, you can depridement, do depridement of the wound. And to give 
antivenom when there is a symptom. But most of the questions about the bandage. So the next will be bandage. If this is not mentioned, we will jump to the uh, uh, to the giving antivenom when symptom is appear. Okay, clear for you all. Okay, that's good. Okay, six months old child come for checkup on questioning about vaccination. Mother said she had only two vaccine, uh, one at birth and the second at two months old. The child is having recurrent uh, upper respiratory tract infection. On examination, child is alert. And T was uh, temperature was within normal, clear discharge from nose. That's mean infected. Let's say it's upper uh, respiratory tract infection, but the temperature was normal. What's the next management in terms of for vaccination? Yes. Is it to investigate underlying cause of uh, upper respiratory tract infection? Is it to give hepatitis B virus vaccine now? Is it to uh, vaccine after fever subside? Is it to give hepatitis B vaccination now and register catch up vaccination? What's your answers for that? The, whenever, according to the protocols uh, in Australia, whenever there is a missing dose of vaccination, we have to give it now, the missed dose, and to uh, do catch-up vaccination. So here the answer will be hepatitis B vaccine now and register for catch-up vaccination. But, but there is uh, another scenario for this. If the same scenario, typical the same scenario, but there is fever. If there is typical scenario, the same like this, but there is fever, let's say not 37, it's 38.8. That means that this child is feverish. What is the next step? The next step, yes, we will not give the vaccine and we will uh, give vaccine after vaccine and catch up, vaccine and catch up after fever subside. Okay, okay. That's good. Twelve years. Uh, there is no cut off uh, for fever uh, in pediatric age group. You can just put it in your mind that if it is above 38, above 38, this is fever, mostly in the exam, uh, as I see previously in, the, in many recalls and even in my exam, they didn't uh, mention a query number. They put it like this, either above uh, 38.5 or within normal. Mostly they said 39. Um, I, Believe me, I didn't see uh, any scenario previously with the query temperature. They either said feverish, fever patient, or write down a high fever. Okay, 12 years old male presented with cyanosis, affect, affecting the lower limb, not the upper extremities. He has history of congenital heart disease. 
cyanosis in the lower limb but not upper extremity with a history of congenital heart disease which of the following is best description the mechanism of this presentation what do you think is it right to left is it left to right cardiomyopathy small vessel peripheral vessel disease yes absolutely it's right to left shunt what we call it what is this phenomena what is this what we call this yes it's absolutely right to left it's called Eisenmenger syndrome yes very well dr shan last question for today is an inguinal hernia a young man complained complain he noticed a swelling in his groin after lifting weight yesterday on examination there was one cm defect uh, in an inguinal area with fat protruding the inguinal canal what will be your treatment so we have an inguinal hernia the defect is 1 cm and what's your treatment is it to reassure is it to do herniography is it to do herniography with mesh or laparoscopic hernia hernial repair herniography with mesh herniography with mesh mm -hmm. What do you think the others? What do you think the treatment? D because of young. Okay, I will ask you um, a question. Let's forget the AMC. Uh, think about your training and your studying in the college when you when you are working in the department of surgery uh, and uh, your surgeon your senior sur surgeons received uh, a bring a patient for examination in front of you and they do examination for an inguinal hernia the patient was normal and the patient I mean was stable and the patient uh, got just a defect of one centimeter the small defect one centimeter small defect containing just fat no bowel inside it does your surgeon will go for doing operation for this or to say reassure yes I want you to think yes I want you to think like that it's reassure regarding the cut point uh, in Australia they make uh, two centimeters is the cut point for doing surgery or not if patient defect uh, hernial defect below uh, two centimeter the treatment will be no treatment reassure so that's how I want you to think If it is less than two centimeter, you can reassure the patient that it's not obstructed hernia, no feature of, of obstruction, so no, no need for surgery right now. Just go home. Okay? Is it clear now? Okay. Okay. This is the last question for today. Thank you for listening. I hope this will be good for you uh, I want you uh, to read the file uh, I posted it it's about 200 and something uh, pages I want you to read it I want you uh, if you face any question there and you don't know what is it just 
take a picture for this question with the answer and put it in the group so I can remember it, so I can remember why I choose this question, this option for the uh, MCQ and we will speak about it. Remind me to, uh, I want to tell you more about how to deal with tetanus prone uh, wounds. So put it in the group and anything you can ask about this lecture in the group and previous lecture. I hope we can make it together. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, 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 bye-bye. See you later, bye-bye.